1 Timothy. <clears throat> Book of 1 Timothy. So Sunday school is back in swing. It's kind of a love-hate relationship with Sunday school, isn't it? You feel that way? Because you have to get up early on a Sunday morning to get here. That's the problem. But I hope you're ready to, uh, to learn some things from the Word of God. It's always good. Uh, when you're teaching, it's nice to have the break for a little while, but there's always kind of the itch to, to get back and um, get into the Scriptures a little bit more. So I hope you feel that same way. We really should pray for the Harringsons. I think they're, they're, in, um, they're at Metropolitan today. They're sending church, and then they leave tomorrow for Mauritius. So be, be in prayer for them. It's an exciting time to head out into the will of God. And, uh, you know, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, right? And finally being able to get out and do the thing that uh, they know God told them to do is exciting. So anyway, we'll pray for them today. Um, look forward to what the Lord's going to do. Uh, as we start out here uh, this morning, you know, um, quite a few weeks ago, I guess it probably two, three months ago now, uh, in preparation for Sunday school, um, I'd been praying and just asking the Lord what I should teach. You know, when you, when you teach the Bible, you have a lot to teach from. And this is a big book. And uh, just trying to figure out what you're supposed to teach. And, you know, when I, I don't know if you teach something or have taught before. I don't know how you do things, but... Uh, with me over the years, kind of what I've done is I've thought, well, Lord, what do the people need? But I stop right there because I have no idea. Um, the Lord knows what we need, but we don't really know what we need. And certainly a, a teacher doesn't know. Um, and so just the Lord just kept steering my heart back to this book. And there's a lot of practical instruction here that I think what we'll do is we're just going to start going through some things here. Now, there's, there's different ways of teaching the Bible. And uh, you obviously have a, a pastor who is a very good uh, teacher of the Bible. And so but the buyer would have gone through, no doubt, numbers of books and certain studies with you. And, and some of those would have taken a long time to go through, right? He would have gone verse by verse by verse. And that's a fantastic way to teach. Uh, I find myself teaching a, a very similar way to that. Uh, but I think what I'm going to do here is, is in 1 Timothy, I don't want to get too deep for this reason. Um, I find it immensely helpful in my life when I read the Bible to, to oftentimes uh, step back and take a broader view of a book, all right, and um, so that we can understand the the simple practicality of that letter and why God put that letter in the Bible. Uh, and I'm, obviously, I'm talking about in a New Testament context. The epistles of Paul are letters. That word epistle, it's a letter. And so, just like with you, if you were to write a letter, a letter is a very practical thing. It has an introduction, it has a conclusion, and it has a body of something in the middle of it. There's a reason that you wrote the letter. You know, dear, dear John, I used to love you. We're through. Signed, Elizabeth, right? I mean, that's, it's got a... So, whatever, whatever the letter is. Well, so it is in the Bible, right? There's a, there's a letter that Paul wrote or that John wrote, and it has, uh, it has a body of truth in it. It has a something there that, um, that is practical and helpful. And so... I want to kind of give 1 Timothy that view for you uh, as we go through this. Now, Timothy, what do we know about Timothy? We know that, um, that Timothy was a young man. We know that Timothy became a pastor. We'll look at some things about that. Uh, but um, when Paul wrote here, Paul wrote to Timothy as uh, his protege in the ministry. And so he's talking to him about a lot of practical things in ministry. And so what I don't want to do with you is I don't want to teach the book from that standpoint, uh, as if everybody here was a pastor and you're going into the ministry, because that, those are the charges that Paul gave to Timothy in this book. But what I do want to do is I want to take the relevant things that will be helpful and useful for a church body uh, or for you individually in your life that, uh, that we can pull out of here. You understand? So I want to kind of view it from that standpoint. So there will be things that will just kind of move past a little bit more quickly, and then some things that we'll slow into and uh, try to get a little bit more deep into it. So 1 Timothy is where I've asked you to be. I think I asked you to be there. But let's go there, 1 Timothy, and let's read uh, some parts of this chapter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, 
Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in the faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, as we've read through those verses, we won't get nearly all the way through that, but uh, did you notice in the Bible, uh, particularly if you're newer to the faith, uh, did you notice that not every verse of Scripture is a single sentence in and of itself? Um, it's important that when you read the Bible that you read it with a natural flow of, of language, okay? So at the end of every verse, you're going to have uh, some different sort of a punctuation mark, and quite often you'll have three, four five verses that are a single sentence. And so in your mind when you read the Bible, read it in its format that way, and it will help you to understand what he's trying to say. Sometimes we read a verse of Scripture because it's verse 1 or verse 4, and in our mind, before we've ever read that verse, our mind is telling us that it is a single unit of thought. But not every verse is a single unit of thought. It's a flow of a sentence. And so you've got to look at the punctuation as you're reading so that you understand broadly uh, what the Lord is trying to tell you here. And so as you'll notice also in Paul's writings, oftentimes Paul, he'll write a half a chapter and it's one sentence. You look in the book of Ephesians, right? The first chapter of Ephesians. And you've got numbers and numbers and numbers of verses that are one sentence. And so you really have to try to dissect all of that and figure out what, what is the Lord trying to teach me here. And so uh, in, in what Paul is saying here, well, let's look at a little bit of a background before we dive into this. Of course, we know that Timothy was the son of a Jewish, a Jewish mother and he had a, a Greek father. And so if you were to, to read uh, things about Timothy that Paul said or in the book of Acts as it describes Paul's interaction with Timothy, you'll find that. Uh, he lived in Lystra. Lystra and Derby were two cities that were about 12 miles apart from each other uh, in modern day Turkey today, but that's where... That's where, um, where Timothy lived. And um, Timothy's mother and his grandmother were both saved. They were Lois and Eunice. And uh, they were both saved women. And on Paul's second missionary journey, he took Timothy along with him, all right? And so he, he had evidently led Timothy to Christ, or Timothy had gotten saved uh, prior to that time. And now on his second missionary journey, Paul finds Timothy, takes him. Uh, he's well reported of now. He's, he's maturing in the faith. And uh, Paul obviously sees in Timothy a, a young man that uh, God has touched his life. And so he says to Timothy, you're coming with me. And so he takes Timothy with him on his missionary journey through Macedonia. But when Paul left to go to Athens, um, he, had, he had Timothy and Silas stay in Berea, all right, in the Bible, you know, Berea. And, um, and so that's where Timothy and Silas stayed. And there's other things that happened there. But eventually, by the time that Paul wrote his letter to the church of Ephesus, which we have in the Bible, Ephesians, right? By that time, Timothy was already the pastor, evidently the pastor uh, of that church in Ephesus. And so what we find in First and Second Timothy is just a lot of practicality here um, for Timothy as a preacher, but also for us as a body of believers. And so I want you to notice here, uh, what he says in verse number two, just look in your Bible. He says, he's writing unto Timothy and notice this. He says, my own son in the faith. Now, before we even get into this book, I want to ask you a question. Do you have a son in the faith? Is there somebody that you personally have invested the scriptures into, have given the gospel to, that you've had the privilege of leading somebody to Jesus Christ and discipling and maturing them in their life. Do you have a son in the faith? Well, one of the things that we should strive for, and I believe that the Lord expects of us, is not only to just shine as lights in a dark world, but uh, to truly go the distance in um, witnessing to and seeking to lead men and women into saving faith in Jesus Christ. 
we all have that responsibility. That's not relegated to a pastor. It's not relegated to a missionary. That is our privilege and duty as believers in Christ to seek the lost and seek to win the lost to Jesus Christ. Now, we know, brethren, that we can't save anybody, right? That's the work of the Spirit of God. But our job is to, to share Christ with the lost around us. And it's not merely the matter of handing out a tract to somebody and then walking away. Um, a, a tract is a useful tool, but what people need is they need the explanation of our lips about the gospel. We need to personally invest the gospel into the lost. Uh, there was a, an old evangelist years ago, his name was Oliver B. Green, and he used to, he used to pray this to the Lord, um, lead us to the soul that's nearest to hell. And the whole idea was, help me to be uh, aware of the lost around me so that I can speak the gospel as I ought to speak into that life to the intent that they may get saved. And that was what we see in Paul's ministry, wasn't it? He was seeking to persuade men to faith in Jesus Christ. And brethren, we need to have that same uh, goal and desire in our life that we would try to win the lost to Christ. And so I ask you, if you've been saved for any period of time, do you have a son in the faith? And if not, why not? It's not that you're not around lost people. Lost people are everywhere. Uh, you may have a job and duties that keep you uh, confined to your home for the most part, and yet you're still around lost people on a regular basis. When you go to the shops, when you go to the fuel station, anywhere you go outside the confines of your home, outside the walls of this church, you're around lost people. And uh, we need to be seeking and saving seeking to save those that are lost, right? That was the whole point behind the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We need to have the same heart. Are you seeking after the lost and seeking to win them to Christ? So Paul is talking to his son in the faith. And I can tell you, there's no greater joy you'll have as a believer than seeing God use you to save somebody, to get the gospel to them. It's God that does the work, but you being an instrument of God's use so that somebody gets saved and then investing in them uh, in their spiritual life. Do you have a son or a daughter in the faith? Um, if you don't, why don't you ask the Lord to, to let you have the privilege of winning somebody to Christ and then discipling them, all right? It's just a part of the Christian life. And so that's what he's, he's talking to Timothy here, all right? Now, let's look at uh, verse number three. So he says this. He says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. So Timothy, uh, I asked you to stay at Ephesus because I'm gonna go into Macedonia. And here's what I want you to do, Timothy. When you're there, I want you to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So here you have this church. We have this group of people now that are, um, that are all meeting together in, in Ephesus. There's a body of elders that are over that church because at that time there was no pastor. And so Paul sends Timothy into this church body and says, all right, I've got some things that I need you to tell the church. I've got other things to do, Paul was saying. I've got to go here and there and there. That was Paul's ministry. Paul was not a pastor. Uh, so he was off uh, winning the lost and you know, seeing new churches established and as he's traveling throughout um, Asia Minor. And yet he says to Timothy, there's a problem in this church at Ephesus and I need you to go address some things in the church. Now listen, every church everywhere has some problems. No such thing as a perfect church. But there needs to be a perfection of doctrine in the church. You may have problems with people because we all have problems from time to time. So there may be things like that in the church, but our doctrine had better be right. And it can be right. And listen, it should be right. It should be right. And so there was a problem in this church. And uh, Paul was saying to Timothy, you need to go fix this problem. Now, um, can I tell you this about a problem in a church? A, a minority problem will, will affect the whole church. Uh, something that seems to be a small matter can affect the whole body. Uh, how... How great a matter a little fire kindles, the Bible says. A, a, a little leaven, leavens what? The, the whole lump, the whole thing. Whether you're talking about a, a ball of dough or you're talking about a group of people, a little leaven, a little wrong doctrine, a little problem is going to affect the whole body. All right, and, and a concern in the church that's left unaddressed will become a crisis in the church. And so we can't allow little things of concern to go on and continue that are not addressed and dealt with because they will blow up into a massive problem. And so there was a concern in the church at Ephesus that, was, that needed to be addressed. And Paul said to Timothy, I need for you to go deal with this. Now, let me just say this, there could be an unres this is not dealing with a, a conflict, but I'm gonna give you a practical application. An unresolved conflict in the church will eventually fester and blow up into a great big problem. 
If there is a, I, I preached this, I think it was last week, about forgiveness, if, if I remember. It seemed like a whole lifetime ago in, in one week. But anyway, if it was last week. Okay, forgiveness, it, that's an important thing. And, and if you're here today and you have an unresolved issue with another brother or sister in this church, then you need to fix that. Stop hiding. Stop waiting for the other person. And you go find that person and in humility fix that issue and resolve the conflict. Okay, that's called maturity. It's time to grow up. And if you have a problem with somebody, go fix it. By the way, there's great joy and tremendous peace that you will have when you fix an unresolved conflict with somebody. It's just like in a family. If a brother and sister are fighting, if a husband or wife are at, at odds with each other, uh, when you fix and finally resolve that conflict in your family environment, there's peace. And you think to yourself, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Well, it's the same thing in a church body. If there's an unresolved conflict between two people, go fix it. And when you fix it, it brings peace and stability back to the body. Okay, it's the same way with doctrine. If there is a, a wrong doctrine that somebody, well, let's say one person in the church is holding to a, an error in their doctrine. And I'm not saying they're doing it out of spite or, or malice. Maybe they're just untaught. Maybe they had, they had some sort of a strange influence that they got from somewhere in some weird sort of thing, and they've kind of held on to it. And so now they have that doctrine uh, in the in the church and they're kind of spreading it around in the background if you as a church body don't squish that thing and deal with it it will blow up in the church it will it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when it will blow up now it could fester for years there is a there's a a church i know uh, here in australia that uh, for many years had something like this happening and there was i i would say a fair number of the church body that was unaware of it but there was still a, a great number of people that were aware of it, but they just kind of fobbed it off as, oh, it's not really that big a deal. It's this so-and-so, it's so-and-so that, that kind of believes this weird and quirky way and it doesn't really affect anybody. It's fine. We're just, you know, we're brothers and sisters. We're family. It's all good. But the problem was that it wasn't all good. And as the years, listen, years were going by and this was being allowed to kind of operate fester bubble in the background, um, this person that, that viewed this the, the Bible a certain way was talking to this person who was talking to this person. You understand how that goes in the background? And uh, there's a greater number of the church that didn't know, but there's a lot that did. And then eventually it erupted. I mean, a massive eruption and uh, a, a major problem. Okay, it's a problem. And Paul is teaching us as believers, you need to deal with problems as they arise. Deal with problems in the church. Okay, so there's no such thing as a, a minority problem. What affects somebody in the body is going to affect the whole body. You understand? That's the point of the body, right? What affects one member affects everybody. And so um, deal with it. And so what was the issue? Well, he said that in verse number three that some were teaching some other doctrine, right? Um, he says, Timothy, you go, you go into Ephesus and you charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Some were teaching other doctrine doctrine. Now, in the second book of Timothy, you don't need to turn over there, but you know the verse in chapter 3, verse 16. Um, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Okay, number one was doctrine. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the four aspects of the Word of God as they benefit us, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy, that's what it is. And there were some that were teaching wrong doctrine. And one of the main purposes of the Scripture is to profit you in doctrine. Now, what is doctrine? Well, doctrine essentially is this is what God said about a matter. Amen. You could pick one of a thousand different doctrines. We'll, we'll say the, the blood atonement. Okay, that's a doctrine of Scripture. In other words, God said, this is what it is. This is truth about this matter. I'm telling you, this is truth about this matter. Here's my doctrine. Okay, the doctrine of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. There had to be a perfect sacrifice for the sin of man. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. Uh, a sinner can't atone for another sinner. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. That was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. I mean, in effect, that's the doctrine of the blood atonement, isn't it? Right? That Jesus Christ was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice once forever for the sin of mankind. Now, that is a doctrine. In other words, that's what God said about a matter. And the Bible's full of doctrine. As you read through the scriptures, what you're seeing over and over and over is God simply saying to you and I, this is what I think about something. 
And in other words, it's not God's opinion. It is a statement of God's absolute fact about the matter. This is what I said. In other words, this is what it is. We use the expression, it is what it is. But God is simply saying in the Bible, it is what I said it is about anything. Whatever God said, that's what it is, okay? That's what doctrine is. Now, I know that's a pretty crude way of looking at it, but all I'm trying to do is make it simple for you, practical, right? That's what doctrine is. It's the truths, um, it's the, the truths, the truths of God or, or about God by God. God is saying, I'm going to give you a truth that's either from me or about me, and I'm the one giving it. That's what doctrine is, all right? Now, <clears throat> um, I think that's why the devil fights so hard in the church, in your spiritual life, uh, in this area. Because uh, doctrine, doctrine defines who and what we are. Okay? We, we hold and espouse to doctrine, which defines what we are. Guys, it's, it's, okay, to, um, it's okay to be defined as something. I think people today are afraid to be defined as anything. They just want to, they want to float around and be all things to all people without any clear definitions. But you and I are defined by something. And what we, what we should be defined by is our belief in this book. We are, we are Bible-believing Christians, are we not? Well, what is that? We're, we're defining ourselves within the, the confounds of this. It's not a denomination. It's not, it's not a creed that we hold to. You understand? It's not like the, the Nicene Creed or some denominational hierarchy that we're under. That's not the umbrella under which we operate. We are defined by, I hope we are, we're defined by the doctrine of the Word of God. Whatever is between the covers of this book, this is what we are, okay? So, um, that's why the devil fights so hard against the, the doctrines of the Word of God. And there's this drive that's been in existence from day one, but a, a drive to change the words of God. Uh, the devil is behind this whole thing. He was there in the garden doing this exact same thing. Remember the first question in the Bible that, the, that was ever asked? It was asked by the devil. And he said to Eve, Yea, did, did God really say this? Hey, Eve, did God really say? What was he doing? He was undermining, call, calling into question the things that God said. And that's what he's trying to do in your life. He's trying to do that in the world. And you know what? He's very successful at it. He, it's a relentless pursuit that the devil has to undermine the authority of the words of God. Now, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir this morning because I know, I know who you are and I know what you've been taught here over all these years. So you understand the, the value and the importance of the word of God, right? And the words of God. But uh, there is this massive drive um, that the devil has to disrupt and to destroy uh, the words of God. So here's what happens. If, if Satan can change the words of God, then what he does is he, he dilutes the instruction that God gave you. If you change the words, then you're diluting what it says. Amen. Right? And God is pretty absolute in the things that he says, right? Um, <clears throat> so... So we'll, we'll get into, I think we'll get into that a little bit more in just a moment. So look at verse number three. He said, I, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Um, there, were, there were false brethren that had, that had come in into the church. There was a danger of false brethren. Um, You know, we, uh, we walk into church and um, we can look the part of a Christian. We can have people who visit the church who, who look like they're Christians. So we're visiting from another place. We heard about the church. We're just passing through, whatever the case might be. And there are people that can come into the church, and no doubt you've seen this over the years here, where people would come in, uh, but they, they come in uh, under false pretenses. They come in with an agenda and with a purpose. And this happens all the time. And Paul is warning here. Um, about false brethren that are coming in. And Jude, Jude talked about this. Um, we'll, we'll look at Jude in the morning service, but he said there are certain, certain men that are crept in unawares. All right, they come into the church under the radar. They just suddenly you realize, oh, th there's somebody here that, wh where did they come from? How did they get here? How long have they been coming? They've, just, they've crept in unawares and uh, endeared themselves in some way to uh, some of the church family, but they've come in uh, subtly with an intent to disrupt and to destroy what God is trying to do. 
And here's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Timothy, when you get to Ephesus and you get around this body, you need to help them to understand here that, that, that uh, there are some who would teach other doctrines than what I've given. And there's men that have crept into the church. And, and Timothy, you tell the church family that they've got to be aware of this, the, the danger of this. In other places in the New Testament, we're talking about wolves. Uh, after my departing, uh, wolves will enter in. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, this very church, right? The Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Grievous wolves are going to enter in. Uh, they're not going to spare the flock. They're going to destroy the flock. They're going to try to get in and, and to destroy it. Now, why would that happen? Why do you think that's going to happen? Why, why, would, why would the devil work so hard at coming into, I mean, effectively, a little church like this in the middle of nowhere? Why would the devil work so hard at trying to disrupt or to destroy what's going on here? Well, I think here's the reason. Because, although this is certainly not the only place around, this is a place, one of the few places around, where the church stands unapologetically on the truth of God. And without a mean spirit, essentially what happens is uh, your pastor says, we are going to preach the whole counsel of God, and we're not interested in whether you like it or not. We're interested in giving you the truth of what God said. And some aren't going to like it. Matter of fact, many aren't going to like it. Okay, but what what happens when truth is preached from the Word of God? What what happens? Uh, it changes the lives of those that hear it. Amen. All right. Some some will reject it, and eventually they will go because they can't handle it. But there will be many who will say, "I invite the criticism of God. I invite the scrutiny of God, and whatever needs to change in my life." I will allow the Lord to, to let that thing change in my life. And what happens? We grow and we mature. And, okay, what's the product of maturity in the Christian life? Well, Christ-likeness. But when we're Christ-like, we have the mind of Christ and we become evangelistic and we are concerned for the lost and the gospel sounds out from this place. You understand? It impacts the darkness. And Satan knows what impacts the darkness. It's not the numbers of people. It's the, the faithfulness and the adherence of people to the truth of the Word of God. And he will disrupt that whether the church is 20 or 2,000. But there may be a church down the road that runs three, four, five hundred, And their whole church is about music and about the social club. We're going to have a coffee lounge. We're going to do things. And there's no truth that's being preached, but we're all worshiping Jesus. And everybody's happy, clappy, and everything's great. But there's no truth and sound doctrine in that church, and the devil is quite happy to let them be what they are because they're not affecting the world. They are infecting the world, and he's quite happy about that. But if you're standing on the truth of the Word of God, the devil will try, and he will not stop trying to infuse false doctrine and wrong people into the body to disrupt and to destroy what God is doing here. So you, you just have to be careful. You understand? That's what Paul's saying. Be careful. Hey, Timothy, you go to Ephesus and you tell them, you better be careful here. All right? Some were listening. They were, they were giving heed to things that they shouldn't have get, given heed to. You know, there's a clear warning in, in Revelation chapter 2. Do you remember Pergamos, the church of Pergamos? And the, and the Lord said to the church of Pergamos, I've got a problem with you to the church body. I have a problem with you because you as a church body have allowed two types of doctrine into the church. It was the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, never mind what those are, but the point is this. The church body had allowed this doctrine to come into the church, and they knew it was there, and they didn't deal with it. And the Spirit of God said, no, -uh, you're, you better deal with this, or I'm going to deal with you. Okay, it matters to God. That's what I'm saying to you. Um, truth, true, right doctrine, it matters to the Lord. Amen. And He's holding the church accountable for that right doctrine, okay? And so he said, uh, he said in verse number, verse, number uh, verse number four, he said, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. All right, so tell the church this. Um, don't teach other doctrine. You just stick with, with what I've told you, the word of God. We're not interested in other things. We're interested in what God said, okay? So that's number one. And then number two, he said, now stop listening to the wrong things. Don't teach the wrong things, but don't listen. Neither give heed. That's what he's talking about. Not giving your ear to it, paying attention to it. To fables and endless genealogies. Now, these are we don't use these expressions of speech in our modern tongue today. And so you might say, well, what in the world is fables? Are we talking about Aesop's fables? Are we talking about Hansel and Gretel? I mean, what are we talking about? No. Here's the fables that we, that we can listen to in churches. Religious fables. Fairy tales. Praying the rosary. Mary the Perpetual Virgin, virgin. Uh, um, 
you know, observing the Sabbath, fables, fish on Fridays, can't eat meat on Fridays. It's a fable, right? Uh, you know, we're bringing in the kingdom. Hello, it's a fable. It has no basis in Scripture. Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. The, have you heard this? That's the Mormon fable. And, and on it goes. Okay, these are fables. And God says, don't pay attention to fables. Don't listen to fables. It's always been a problem, but it's far worse today than, it, than it's ever been because we have so much access to in, instant information. And because we do, we listen to podcasts and we listen to YouTube clips and we listen to our favorite this and our favorite that online. And the fables just come nonstop into our, into our heart. Again, Paul never had to deal with that. If, if there was going to be a problem, it was because somebody physically showed up and wormed their way into the hearts of the people and tried to indoctrinate them with wrong teaching. But today, nobody physically has to show up. You can just listen to your favorite podcast and it's already in your heart. You have to be careful. I mean, this, I don't want to get off on, on a sidetrack, but God didn't give you an internet pastor. Amen. You're not supposed to get your doctrine from somebody that just looks good or has a slick looking website or a great podcast. You get your doctrine from the Word of God. God gave you a church family, a church assembly. That's, that's what God gave you. And so he's saying, don't give heed to fables. And then he talks about these endless genealogies. This doesn't really matter to us, but back in this day, it really mattered because these Jewish rabbis were still all, all around the place. And they were talking about their lineage and the writings of the fathers. And they were replacing all of that with biblical, with biblical truth. Okay, they were, they were replacing it, placing it above the scriptures. And those are just the, the commandments of men. You've heard of the Talmud, the, Jew, the Jewish Talmud, right? It's basically what that was, was that was an, a Jewish interpretation of what the Bible said. And they hold that second to the Holy Scriptures. Well, that's what they, they claim. But they actually put that above the Bible. And they teach for doctrine the commandments of men. And Paul said, don't do it. Don't do it. Now, what was the outcome of this? All right. Look at verse number four. He says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Okay, it ministers questions. When you allow wrong doctrine and fables, fairy tales to come into the church, you know what that does? That just causes questions to arise in your heart. It ministers questions. What's the end of questioning? Doubt. It's the undermining of your faith. Why would you do that? The problem with men is we've always been looking for something new. I want a new body shape on my car, so I can't wait for next year. Let's see what they're going to do next year. I want a new this, and I want a new that. Well, you know what? We come to church, and well, I'm, I want a new truth. I, I want a new version. Oh, I want new music. I'm tired of the old. And I'm, say, I'm saying to you... Um, there, there is no new when it comes to the things of God. Amen. What God was is what God is. It's not going to change. And the truth of God from all those generations ago is still the truth of God today. Amen. So you don't need anything new. All right? It, it just makes you question and doubt what God said. A question of belief. And that's what the, the problem was that the people have. All right? It ministers questions. Yeah, confusion comes into the church when you teach your own doctrine. So don't do it. Don't teach your little pet doctrines. And, and by the way, the safeguard of the church, this is so important because sometimes in our churches we, we miss, I think we miss the point here. The safeguard of the church is not a select group of spiritual men that are the watchdogs for the church. It's important to have men like that for sure. But brethren, listen, you are the safeguard of the church. It's not a couple of gatekeepers that keep it out of the church. It's you. The safeguard of the church is you. When Paul told Timothy to go to Ephesus and tell the people this, he wasn't, he wasn't telling Timothy, now you tell the elders this. He says, you tell the church this. Now, brethren, uh, there are no gatekeepers to the church. It's you are the gatekeeper. If you're, if you're part of this body, if you're saved, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the same responsibility to know the doctrines of the Bible and to mature and grow in your faith. You have as much responsibility to safeguard the purity of the church as anybody else does. It's not just the pastor, pastoral responsibility. It's your responsibility too. You should have enough care for the church family that you safeguard the doctrine here and make sure that nothing gets in through the doors. But if we, if we relegate that to a specific group of select people, 
then um, it's easier for something to get through the cracks. But if you are maturing and growing and understanding and knowing the doctrines of the Word of God yourself, you're not going to allow things through the door. You're going to hear it in a casual conversation and you're going to go, whoa, time out. No, that's not what the Bible says. That is not truth. That is error. And maybe you have to instruct somebody who's ignorant or maybe you have to rebuke somebody uh, who's intentional in what they're doing. But, but it's, there's, it's not a gatekeeper to the church. You, as the body, are the, are the gatekeepers, all of you. Every single member, all right? So I don't think any false doctrine is going to get into the church if the church knows its Bible. If you as a church family, if you know what God said, error is not going to come in because you are students of the Scriptures. When the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, that wasn't just given to a preacher. Amen. All of us should study the Scriptures so we know what the Bible says. All right? So it's, it's not that we have our hackles up when we walk into church. You know that expression, right? But we should have our guard up. And when you see somebody you don't know, it doesn't mean you look at them across the room with a sideways glance, but why don't you go find them, shake their hand, have a conversation, introduce yourself, find out who they are. Don't you think that's safe for the body? Well, sure it is. You care about people, but you care about the church. Care about it, all right? Um, all right, so he says in, uh, in verse number four, so don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in the faith. All right, here's the outcome of right doctrine in the church. Um, it's edifying. When the right thing is being taught in the church, biblical doctrine is being taught, what it does is it edifies. All right, so the purpose of right teaching is to edify. What is edify? It's to strengthen, to build up. It's to mature you in your faith. That's what it is. So in the sense of architecture, it's building a structure. And that's what it is in the, in the church body. Um, godly edifying is the deliberate building of people's lives. But it's building not based on the opinion of the teacher, but the truth of what God said. It's just building. All right? That's what edifying is. It's the responsibility of every single one of you, if you're saved, to edify one another. It's not just the job of the teacher. It's all of us as we have a responsibility to edify and build one another up. And notice what he said. Now, he said in verse 5, look at it. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So, in other words, he says to Timothy, Timothy, listen, I'm going to give you something to command the church, and here's what you tell them. Uh, don't, don't teach other doctrine other than what I've given you. Uh, Timothy, you tell people, you command them with authority, um, you don't give heed to fables, religious fairy tales that are not grounded in the truth of God uh, or, or genealogies because none of that matters, but there has to be godly edifying in the faith. Now, Timothy, when you do this and you instruct this, the end of commanding those people is going to be charity. Okay, The end of this commandment to the church, what's going to happen in the church body as a result of them listening to your command is there's going to be charity in the church. What's charity? We, we can overly simplify charity by, talking, by saying it's love. And it's, it is, but it's not just that, okay, in the sense of a romantic type of love. But in its simplest terms, uh, it's, it's an expression of love between believers. Uh, when you see charity given to us in the Bible, it's 28 times it shows up in the Bible. Every single time it deals with um, the, the demonstration of love between believers. It doesn't deal with our, our love for the world outside, lost people, but it deals with how, how we express our love one to another as believers. Okay, it, Essentially, that's what charity is. So God is saying here, here, we guard ourselves against error and all of these silly fictions that we can, we can bring up. And the, when we guard ourselves against that, the only thing left is that we are edifying one another and we're demonstrating charity one to another. Have fervent charity among yourselves, the Bible says. Fervent in other words, the demonstration of genuine love between one another needs to be something that's fervent and practiced in the church. Uh, Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. The demonstration of that love, that's charity. How are you demonstrating your affection and, and genuine love for believers, right? That's, it matters to the Lord. Um, would you look at verse number five? He says, now the end of the commandment is charity, but notice this, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Okay, the expression of charity, the demonstration of charity in your life toward another believer is the result of these three things that he said. A, a pure heart, a pure heart, meaning you have, you have pure motives in, in your life and in your purpose. You have a pure heart. 
doesn't mean you're sinless. That's not what he's talking about. But your motive for what you do is, is pure and right. He said, it's a pure heart. He said, a good conscience. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's, it's right judgment in a moral sense. You're, you're operating under right judgment. Conscience is a compound of two words, con, science, with knowledge. Okay? So in other words, the things that you know are right, you're operating under, under those things. You're subjecting yourself to what you know is right. You're living your life under what you know is right. Okay? That's when you live your life that way, you can demonstrate real charity because you're living according to what you know is right. And then you're demonstrating love to other believers. And then he said, in, in an unfeigned faith, faith unfeigned. Well, what is that? Well, that's just a sincere Christian life. Have you known somebody... Do you know somebody now who says that they're a Christian and maybe you think they genuinely are, but they just don't act very sincere? Do you know somebody like that? And you're like, well, you know, they say, I'm praying for you. And you're thinking to yourself, sure you are. You know, God bless you. But it just, it's almost like Christian platitudes, but there doesn't seem to be any sincerity behind it. What Paul is saying here is if true charity is going to come out in your life, it's going to come because you as an individual have an unfeigned faith. There is a sincerity, a genuine sincerity with the Lord. I can think of a man right now who's a dear friend of mine, but he is a dear, dear Christian man. And the one thing that I know about him is um, in ev virtually every interaction that I can think going back many years, um, he is the most sincere man I think I know. And when we have a conversation about something and the Lord, you know, invariably comes into that conversation, when he speaks, there's an evident uh, sincerity. It is an unfeigned faith. It just comes out of him. There's no platitudes, no Christian niceties. It's just sincere. Okay. Now, when, when you have a, a pure heart and what's the other thing he said? Um, a good conscience and an unfeigned faith, the result coming out of your life is going to be charity that's demonstrated one to another. It, to me, that's convicting, guys. It's worth looking at your life and evaluating, are those three ingredients in my life so that I can demonstrate the right kind of love one for another, all right? So he said, that's the end of the commandment. Now, what happens when you turn from that? All right, we're moving on. We'll, we'll be done here in just a moment. Verse number five, he said... Um, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. All right, so when you turn from these right things, what's left? He, he said he, some people have swerved. You ever swerved in your car? Right? I, I came down yesterday from Inverell, so it was like a 10-hour drive coming back down here. And I, I, think I, I think I passed 50 dead kangaroos on the road, um, probably 10 or 15 feral pigs that were dead on the side of the road. I mean, somebody didn't swerve. Right? There's a lot of dead animals on the road. Okay, Paul's saying right now, when you turn aside from these ingredients in your life, you are swerving. You are, you are turning aside from something that's right. That's what he says, swerving. You're missing the mark. You're deviating from what God said. And he said, you turn aside unto vain jangling. Again, we don't use the word anymore, but you know what that word, that vain jangling means? It just means empty talk. You've got a lot of words coming out of your mouth, but you're not saying anything. There's no value to what you say. It's just, it's just hot air. It's just empty words that mean nothing. Have you ever been around somebody like that? They're talking and you're thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? What are you even saying? Yeah, but we can be that way in church, can't we? If we're not careful. So the end of the commandment, all right, is charity out of a pure heart, good conscience, and unfeigned faith. Now, when that happens, when that happens, there's true love being demonstrated. But when that doesn't happen and you turn aside, you're swerving away, you're missing the mark that God has set for your life. What's the result of that going to be? It's going to be empty words. It's going to be vain, meaningless, profitless discussions about things that have no value, that do not edify. Really what they do is they just cause division and question among the body. Don't do it. Don't do it, but there's people to do it, all right? And th then he said in verse number seven, they desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where of the affirm. People want a platform. Okay, here's one of the big dangers in church. I'll be done with this, but here's one of the big dangers in church. There will occasionally be somebody who desires to have a platform. And they know that they can't actually physically stand up here and address the church body. So what they do is they subvert and they go into the background and they look for the weaker sheep and they'll go find that person 
because they want a platform. They, they want an audience. They, they desire to have a platform. I'm going to tell you what I am. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I'm going to tell you why I'm right. Okay, they're, they're desiring followers. And Paul is saying, no, no, you be careful about people like that. Again, I'm thinking in my pastorate of people that, there are a couple of people over the years that have done that. Some of them we had to just say, you, you, go, you, you go, you can't stay, you go. All right? Um, not because we're, we're guarding a position or we don't want anybody to teach. It's not that. It's just they, they desire to be teachers. But Paul said here, they don't understand what they're saying or where they're affirming. They, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't even understand what they're agreeing with. They, they affirm things, but they don't even understand what they're talking about. That's the problem with people like this. What, what's, the, what's the reason? They've swerved aside from what's right. So the lesson this morning, these first seven verses, really just comes back to one simple thing for us. All right, the way that you guard the the purity of the church, the assembly, the way you guard yourself is that you as individual believers here, that you know the words of God yourself, that you understand the scriptures, that you become a student of the scriptures so that you can guard the doctrinal purity of the place, of the assembly that God has put you into because it matters to the Lord. And there will be some who will try to subvert you. There will be some who come in from the back and try to find little followers and groups and undermine the teaching of the Word of God by getting their own little cliques and clans. He says, you be aware of that. And it's by your fidelity to the Word of God that you can keep that from happening in the church and you can guard the church. Because in Revelation 2, when I told you about Pergamos, uh, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, walks in the midst of this candlestick and the doctrines being taught here and being tolerated here, he observes them and it matters to him what's being taught and tolerated. So we just need to guard that, okay? All right. All right, Father, we're, uh, we're grateful for the practicality of this uh, book today. And I pray that it would be helpful for us as we think about our life. Um, help us to go away. Uh, if nothing else, Lord, just determined that we will become uh, students of the Scriptures at a deeper level, that we will be guarded uh, about what we allow into our own life and what we allow into the church. And uh, so, Lord, I do pray for your, your help uh, in our life this week. Uh, Lord, bless the service to come, and uh, we pray you'd save the lost and edify the saved. In Jesus' name, amen.